we're getting remarkable feedback from the people that are doing this about the kind of state that it puts them in, both engaged and present with the bigger picture. Dr. Andrew Huberman is an esteemed neuroscientist and tenured professor at Stanford School of Medicine. He pioneers research in brain development, function, and neural plasticity. I would say this is the fundamental step of any good morning. If you can learn to do this, you will do your best work. You are actually tuning up and making your neural circuits for focus and attention better. Famously, Huberman talks a great deal of his extensive morning routine secrets to live a supercharged day. So a lot of times people will say, how can I lift more, focus better, um, remember things better? It's like, well, let's think about the foundation of that. Enhancing brain performance, combining physical activity, mindful practices, and strategic nutrition for optimal daily functioning. And if you don't do this enough, you are messing yourself up in a number of ways. So what does his morning routine focus on? And how can we learn from him to help ourselves start the day correctly without getting fatigued before the day even begins? You know, I'll probably go into the grave saying this, so forgive me if people have heard me say this before, but the single best thing you can do for your sleep, your energy, your mood, your wakefulness, your metabolism is to get natural light in your eyes early in the day. So I get up, obviously I use the restroom, I drink some water. I do think that hydrating is very important. Yes. Uh, so I will, I'll drink some, some water. And then the fundamental layer of health is to set your circadian rhythm. The simplest way to do that is to go outside for 10 minutes and get some bright light in your eyes. The system is set to make the rest of the day even better. Because we often hear about the perfect morning routine, but we're not thinking about how that routine influences the rest of the mm. day's routine. Yes. Starting the day with sunlight exposure serves as another means of synchronizing your body's internal functions. Each morning, our bodies naturally release a surge of cortisol, often referred to as the stress hormone, which kickstarts our metabolism and bolsters our immune system. However, Failing to signal to our bodies that it's morning by making contact with sunlight can delay this wake-up call, leading to sluggishness throughout the day. Consistently postponing exposure to daylight, such as waiting until the afternoon to venture outdoors, has been linked to conditions like insomnia and depression. You do not have to look directly into the sun, but you do want to get outside out of shade cover if you can, because once every 24 hours, you're going to get a, a peak in cortisol, which is a healthy peak. You want that peak to happen early in the day because it sets up alertness for the remainder of the day. Mm. There are really nice studies done by my colleagues in Stanford Psychiatry and Biology Department showing that if that cortisol peak starts to drift too late in the day, you start seeing signs of depression. It's actually a well-known marker of depression. So you want that cortisol almost stressed out kind of oh, the day's beginning I have a lot to do feeling that's a healthy thing you want that happening early in the day mm. the sunlight will wake you up and what's really cool is that over time you'll start to notice the sunlight waking you up more and more the system becomes tuned up if you miss a day it's not the end of the world because it's a as we call it, a slow integrating system but don't miss more than one day and if you live in an area where it's very cloudy outside just know that the sunlight the photons coming through that cloud cover are brighter than your brightest indoor lights. So get that morning light. That this is, it sets a number of things in motion, such as your melatonin rhythm to happen 16 hours later to help you fall asleep. I would say this is the fundamental step of any good morning. And if you don't do this enough, you are messing yourself up in a number of ways. Huberman says, by looking at sunlight through a window, it's 50 times less effective than if that window were to be open mostly because those windows filter out a lot of the wavelengths of blue light that are essential for stimulating the eyes and this wake-up signal. Light can affect mood in several ways, by directly modulating the availability of neurotransmitters such as serotonin, which is involved in mood regulation, and by entraining and stabilizing circadian rhythms, thereby addressing circadian desynchronization and sleep disorders which are rather common in people suffering from mental disorders. Therefore, in the last decades, light as an intervention, light therapy, has found an increasingly widespread use for treating mood and other psychiatric disorders. So then I come back inside and then I do not drink caffeine right away. It's important in many ways to delay caffeine enough so that you can clear out some of the chemical signals in the brain and body that lead to a, that, 
lead to a feeling of fatigue. So the longer you're awake, mm. the more a molecule called adenosine builds up in your system. And when you sleep, you push that adenosine level back down. Adenosine is a neural transmitter that acts as the body's messenger, which tells your brain when it's time to rest. Throughout the day, as your brain works and uses energy, adenosine levels gradually build up. When these levels get high enough, they signal to your brain that it's time to wind down and get some sleep. The higher your adenosine levels in your brain, the more tired that you feel. When you wake up in the morning, that adenosine level can be zero, but oftentimes there's still some hanging around. Caffeine is an adenosine antagonist. It blocks adenosine function. It's a little more complicated than that, but that's effectively what it does. So if you wake up and you've got, let's say 20%, let's make, uh, this is arbitrary, but 20% of your adenosine has still hasn't been cleared out. That's sort of a drowsiness that you woke up with. Mm -hmm. Then you go and you drink your coffee and you crush that, that uh, ability of adenosine to have that effect, but it hasn't gone away. So that when your coffee wears off mid morning, now that adenosine is there and you feel like there's a mid-morning crash or an afternoon crash. So I delay my caffeine intake for about 90 and ideally 120 mm. minutes after I wake up. So caffeine in the form of coffee is great, but you should probably drink two volumes of water for every one volume of, of coffee you drink in order to hydrate. And a lot of people feel jittery when they drink caffeine or they feel lightheaded or they suddenly get hungry. Oftentimes that's because they're sodium depleted. Mm. There's a lot of good science now to support the fact that if you're feeling lightheaded or you feel like you have quote unquote low blood sugar, oftentimes taking a little pinch of salt, putting it in some water and drinking that, maybe with some lemon juice to adjust the taste, all of a sudden you, your shaking stabilizes, you feel more alert. Why? Because salt, Salt and water have an interesting relationship. It increases blood volume, and oftentimes then you're getting more blood flow to the brain simply by in increasing your sodium intake. The firing of neurons is mediated by the entry of sodium into the nerve cells, and to some extent, similarly with the exit of potassium. You also need electrolytes for your nerve cells to fire, so when you're dehydrated, you can't think or function as well. Andrew Huberman says that instead, drink water first thing in the day, Given that caffeine is very dehydrating and it causes effects on the kidneys where you will start to excrete sodium, potassium, and electrolytes. He mentions that one way that you can avoid the afternoon crash that most of us experience is to delay your caffeine intake 90 to 120 minutes after you wake up. By prioritizing both sun exposure and exercise first, you'll be able to avoid the afternoon energy slump. One is that Everybody should be getting 120 to 150 and maybe even 150 to 180 minutes of so-called zone two cardio a week. This is the kind of cardiovascular exercise where you're doing work, you could have a conversation, but you're kind of at the threshold where it's not super easy to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. We're not talking sprints. Andrew Huberman recommends a combination of zone two and zone five cardio training. Zone two includes activities that elevate your heart rate without causing undue stress like brisk walking, light jogging, or cycling. Ensure that these sessions last for at least 45 minutes. On the other hand, Zone 5 exercises are rather intense workouts such as sprinting, heavy weightlifting, or high-intensity interval training. These are activities to push your heart rate to its maximum. By intelligently combining Zone 2 and Zone 5 training, one can achieve improved heart health, endurance, and metabolic function all while keeping the workouts diverse and interesting. The, there's just a myriad of effects on heart health, uh, you know, vascular health all over the body, gut microbiome, mus Everything. musculoskeletal yeah. stability, mental health, all these kinds of things. So I have a routine where I either weight train for an hour in the morning or I do a portion of that weekly cardio. Mm -hmm. And I just alternate weight train one day, cardio the next, weight drink. And then one day a week, I don't do anything. I don't do any exercise. So we could talk about that. Then I would shower and do my 90 work minute work bout, but sometimes I do the 90 minute work bout first. Mm -hmm. And that's generally what, when I'm starting to drink the caffeine. And so this 90 minute work bout is a kind of combined meditation, but also functional work for me. So for me, that could be writing. It could be planning a podcast. It could mm -hmm. be um, reading. It's something that's kind of hard. And the thing to understand about this 90 minute work bout is that you should expect some friction early on. It's not like you just flip a switch and you're in. 
that it takes some time to get into this focus mode and throughout that time, your brain will flicker. Meditation is a practice aimed to enhance one's core psychological capacities, such as attentional and emotional self-regulation. In several styles of practice, focused attention meditation involves sustaining attention to present moment experiences without emotional reaction and judgment, and has been found to produce significant beneficial outcomes, such as stress reduction and improvements in attention processing. During this time, Andrew Huberman mentioned that for 90 minutes, he'll typically try to perform mental activities such as reading a research article from start to finish, working on a document such as a grant or research paper, planning or researching for a podcast. He mentions trying to get his brain into a linear mode and avoid distraction that's created by social media, email, and the internet in general. If you want to do work that matters, you need to create a state of mind that lets you focus on what's important to you. The more input you receive from the outside world, the more likely it is that you get pulled away from your own ideas and priorities. If you can learn to do this 90 minute bout, you will do your best work. And what's really wonderful is it's not just about the work that you perform in that bout. What ends up happening is really special. This sort of combined meditation work bout, as I'm calling it, has this effect of you are actually tuning up and making your neural circuits for focus and attention better. You can drop in like a laser. And you, and so that's a, a, a holy part of my morning, as wow. holy as the sunlight viewing. Wow. And it's something that's very hard to build in, but I actually schedule it just like I would a Zoom call. But that 90 minute work bout, if I can do all those things and then get that 90 minute work bout and then eat my lunch, I feel like the system is set to make the rest of the day even better. Because we often hear about the perfect morning routine, but we're not thinking about how that routine influences the rest of the mm, day's routine. Yes. And in the end, it's all about the bigger picture, right? Because it's about not just what you do with your life, but how you're gonna create good in the world. <laughs>